Thank you so much. Um, good evening. Good evening. Oh, thank you. I always like uh, a lot of feedback. Um, welcome to King's College London. And I really want to say that it's a pleasure to host this. It's a really, really uh, creative initiative, especially for academics who tend to write uh, volumes without quite telling their story. So this opportunity to tell my story uh, is one that I've found really an excellent one. I listened to Nancy. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. I listened to you and I started to see a lot of points of intersection in our narratives. And I, I'm a firm believer, I, th I think the, the point you were making about uh, the bridge between uh, uh, you know, academia and the world of policy and practice is the greatest challenge that I've had as an individual. As I listened to you, Nancy, I, I, I knew that I could reinforce my own personal philosophy. It's a belief and I think one can test it. You can test the fact that there's typically, there's usually an unbroken cord between your, one's personal narrative and values and your vision of change and the leadership decisions you make when your moments of opportunity come in life. Those moments of opportunity might be few and far between, but you will one day find yourself at that moment and your vision of change might just be realized, even if only for a moment. I was born in the UK. At the age of two, I was born to parents who were students here. Uh, initially, on, I, I believe my father was in a Commonwealth scholarship. Then they got married. Then they were loving each other. And they had a baby, but they were still in school. Decisions, oh well, my mom got pregnant first and foremost. Decision time, they kept it, otherwise I won't be here. That was in 1965 in February. They had me, and then they made that smart decision, which is one of the best things that I think happened to me in life, to send me back home to Nigeria to be raised by my grandmother. I was only two. So they continued their education. My grandmother had my mother as her only child. And I think at that time she was already in her 60s because she had my mother late in life after many attempts. Uh, she probably, one of my grandmothers I know, got pregnant 11 times, actually delivered babies 11 times. In this case with my grandmother, only one survived, my mother. My grandmother was thrilled to have me. Well, what do I remember? Well, I don't remember anything of my first uh, year or so in Nigeria. But that has been the greatest love story in my life. I was raised in a village, just like you, Nancy. No electricity, no pipe bomb water. I was oblivious to much of this because I had love. It was a love story from the word go. I thought she was my mother. I didn't know any better. I always asked her, why are you so old? People are asking me whether you're my mother, but people say you're an old woman, so why? You know, at what age did you have me? And she would tell me all sorts of uh, stories. There was this picture on the wall of my parents. I didn't know that at the time. Who are these people? They're your family in a faraway place in the UK. Uh, and in my mind's eye, there were always plenty of lights. I saw I, I was a very imaginative person. But my values, the values that shaped my life were born uh, through that relationship of love, trust, communality, faith, and I had this sense of adventure that I didn't know where it came from. But I know that at the age of six, I would run to the next village with people who were doing inter-house sports and all those things. I would stay there till later my grandmother would have been looking for me. Discipline, waking up bright and early, fetching water from the river, all those things that I took for granted as everyday things. That was my childhood. One fine day, I saw this man who looked like a photo on the wall. 
I think I was eight at the time. I ran to my grandmother. I said, there's a man who looks just like that photo. By that time, I already knew, though, that that was my dad. But someone looks like that photo who you say is my dad, and he's outside. But I was a stranger to my parents. We got to know each other. We had a relationship. But really, there was no other parent and no other love that I knew like this old woman who raised me. She prepared me for the world in ways that I think no other thing could have shaped. Then I started to live in the city. I went to Lagos, this noisy place, this place where all sorts of things happened. I was excited about it, but something struck me about how you would live in a city and no one seemed to care for the other. That life in the village where you all knew each other, you stepped in when my grandmother was sick, all of the neighbors would come to help us. And so that sense of well-being, peace of mind that you had, you started seeing it disappear. But nonetheless, I was crisscrossing many worlds very rapidly because that sense of adventure never left. I went to university in Nigeria. I never minded my business. I became vice president of the Students' Union. And one of the things I did in university was to crisscross West African borders. I would hitchhike in the middle of the night all the way to Republic of Bene, Togo, Ghana, from parts one, from years one to four, and go to Liberia. And I met some of the dearest friends, uh, student leaders themselves, that I remember till today. I never thought I would come to the UK and spend I think 30 years I'm still counting. It's unbelievable, 30 years this year. Finished my first degree, came here to King's. Uh, I thought I would do a, a few short courses in 1986. I'm still here. I've done other things since then, but here I am. So I told my folks I'll be back. They had other plans for me. You have to study law after this. I never really wanted to be a lawyer. Interestingly, I got here after that first year here. I still tried to do law. I didn't like it. I dropped out. I came back here for my master's and my PhD. But those friends I left back in Liberia, in West Africa, especially the Liberians, started to experience a civil war. And that was another great influence in my life. People that I liked, got on with, and we formed bonds of fresh friendship together, began to lose their families in the Civil War. I had started my PhD uh, first year. I wrote my proposal on military coups because the incident of coups in us, you know, when we were younger, on several locations there was a coup. You knew that you heard a military, once you heard the military tracks on the radio in the morning, you knew there was a coup. So I was fascinated by this. This was one of the things I wanted to study. Then as my friends, uh, a few died, uh, a few lost their relatives, and I started to see what was happening in those wars. I was very motivated to change my PhD subject. I started writing on peacekeeping in Liberia. The response to that war was something that I followed so closely I changed my PhD topic. But I became troubled by how people treated one another. The kinds of atrocities that were committed in the Liberian Civil War before the Sierra Leone War were things that I had never known to be possible. But they were committed in the roughest of ways. Some of you would have followed what happened in Sierra Leone, the chopping of limbs and so on. I always, in any case, when I was much younger, I didn't think I would be an academic. I thought I would be some kind of intermediary of sort. I would be mediating something. I might be a diplomat. I loved the idea of working for the United Nations. I would go to the careers office at King's, fill the form. It never happened. Anyway, I finished this PhD thesis on the civil war in Liberia. My phone rang one day. It was this ambassador I had seen. Uh, ah, my journey in King's was that I spent uh, the first couple of years after my PhD here, I did all sorts of things uh, whilst I was studying. Charing Cross, Leicester Square, 
I ran the Burger King restaurant there in Leicester Square, did a lot of shifts because I paid my way all through. I never did any of these degrees on scholarship. I paid my own way. After all of those experiences, I sold insurance on the streets. I would have been one of those nuisances uh, stopping you on the road, asking you whether you wanted to fill a form uh, and things like that. Anyway, I went to South Africa on an exchange program, came back, finally got the job that I wanted at King's. My phone rang. It was Ambassador Olara Otuno at the UN. At the time, he was uh, Kofi Annan's uh, Under Secretary General for Children Affected by Armed Conflict. I didn't know at the time how he got my name, but he said, this is Olara, Olara Otunu. I thought, oh my goodness, how, this guy I see on TV, what does he want from me? So he says, well, two people mentioned you this week as someone who might be interested, um, who I might appoint as an expert on West Africa who has done work on peace and security in West Africa. I want to do some work on children affected by war. So I said, Ambassador Otunu, I'll have to give it a miss. I am so sorry about this. It was always my dream to work for the UN, but I have just been given a job at King's, and I don't want to burn my bridges. Anyway, he took no for an answer. He didn't take no for an answer, rather, and called my bosses, called my colleagues, and I found myself uh, in 1999, late 1999, on a short-term uh, mission to work with him for six months. Kings released me uh, the same way they released me to South Africa on an exchange uh, program as a fellow. Um, I was off to New York. One of the tr most transformative experiences of my life. I was an analyst. I looked at peacekeepers, how they uh, responded to war. I went to Liberia in the heart of the civil war for my field research. It was rough, but some of my mates at King's were also there at the time. I spoke to soldiers, spoke to commanders, uh, dealt with politicians, peacemakers, and so on. On this occasion, I was going as an analyst uh, to look at children affected by armed conflict. I went with Ambassador Otunu to Guinea, uh, Sierra Leone, and in Sierra Leone, he went with UNICEF, we flew to one of the camps, and that experience of my life, I'll never forget, even as I stand here. There were hundreds of children. Some, one sleeper, just under pants, um, no clothes. Some, no sleepers, uh, some skimpy clothes. And when the UNICEF representative and my boss and some other officials, and I was his assistant, I just stood on the side. When they got to the front of that queue, of that uh, place, massive audience, open field, these children sang their hearts out. They bellowed, welcoming Mr. UNICEF, angelic voices. I went to the truck on the side, to, to the van, the UN van that brought us. I wept like a baby. These were children who had, were orphans, who had lost their parents, who had nothing, smiled, sang for these people who had come in helicopter, prestigious vehicles. I didn't know anything about the impact of war. That transformed me in a sense. I go back to New York, and as a professional officer, desk officer for Sierra Leone, uh, someone running the Africa program in that office, I would sit in closed door meetings of the UN Security Council. I would sit in general assembly uh, committees where the issue of children and war, uh, where those issues were being discussed. I would look around the room, no African voices as such, or disinterested voices, or empty seats of the African representatives in the General Assembly, or people looking tired, 
gray-haired men, at least from my point of view, my 30s at the time, and other people were speaking for Africa, where all these children had been dispossessed in this way. Or no one, no African was at the table. And during the General Assembly, many, many, many officials were shopping rather than sitting in the room. I must say that some were serious. I saw some countries like South Africa, like Ghana, like Kenya, in fact, were speaking. But for the vast majority of those cases, in the vast majority of cases, non-Africans were speaking for Africa, about Africa. Many well-meaning, but many ignorant about the real plight of people. So I sat in task force meetings speaking about children, but because the military, and actually I analyze the military a lot, but suddenly I found out that only military hard security things won the day, not the immediate issues that affected women and children. That touched me. My contract was renewed. I chose to come back to King's. It was three years after I had left, just over three years. My moment of opportunity came coming to King's. Because what did I find out at the United Nations as a young African woman? That Africa's place really on the global stage was insignificant. That young African women, young people in a sense at the UN, hardly ever, please, I'm overgeneralizing. There's some bright young people at the UN, but in the vast majority of cases, our voices were not really heard. Not the young Africans. No matter how bright you were, how brilliant your ideas were, you would have to find the right mentors and it would take you a long time to even get your foot in the door. I didn't want that kind of career. I returned to King's. Moment of opportunity was my boss called me and said, there's a vacancy. We've looked at you, you've grown. Would you like to head the Conflict Security and Development Group? I wanted two things. I said, I'd like to play to my strengths. My adventurous self kicked in again. I'd like to play to my strength, but I'd also like to include a pet project on the program. What was that pet project? I said, I want to try this. Maybe bring three uh, or so young African women who were not uh, necessarily fresh school leavers, who were bright, who were already doing interesting things in the communities, responding to conflict, maybe bring them to Kings for a few months. And why did I say so? Because I realized that one of the biggest gaps at the United Nations was that most of the people did not have expertise on the issues. So you talked about Security Council resolutions uh, and so on. How you get from point A to point B, the expertise you needed to be able to negotiate was not what many young Africans had. Many seasoned diplomats had it, but you couldn't ask many more young women uh, like me. And I believe that actually I'm the first African woman to have had a PhD in World Studies at King's. There have been other African women since me, not many. But at the time I was studying here, the idea of security studies is not something that a woman did regularly. Uh, part, in my master's class, there were three women, myself, another African woman, I think, and a Japanese woman. So it, it's not a subject of women. So why not give bright, committed women expertise in this field? Let them come. Let them go and mix it at the decision-making tables at the African Union and ECOWAS. So I had a stage to begin to test it. We got Funders from outside, Sigrid Rousing Trust was the first. Kings made some contribution. We brought three women per year. And I said, I'll pilot this for three years. We received 200 applications for three places. The second year, another uh, 300 applications and so on. Then DFID put money into it uh, for a while. And then the Carnegie Corporation of New York put money after that, we started bringing uh, a mixed cohort, young men and women. 
We still had the, the, this was, we started this program in 2005. I think the fellow, first fellow walked through the door in 2006, 10 years later. We have trained 100 young Africans in this program. What separates them? Because really for me, for a continent that is so wealthy, that is well endowed in natural resources, poor leadership, leadership deficit is at the core of the armed conflicts that we have seen that cause that sense of suffering for all those young children. The absence of values that can build communities, that can get people to love each other and resolve conflict the other way, is a big issue. There are many brilliant African leaders who went to Oxford, Cambridge, have come to all sorts of Ivy League institutions in the world. It has not made them better leaders. So what are we doing differently? I was convinced that what we needed was a set of core values alongside the degrees that we were offering them. The pursuit of excellence, African-led ideas, that you're able to speak with boldness around the table and say, what your issues are, and set your own agenda yourself so that other countries who are well-meaning, non-Africans will add value to what you want. Independent thinking, integrity, a respect for diversity in all its forms. Those are values that we ingrained into the program from the word go. And that was 10 years ago. But we didn't just build it at King's in 2010, we set up a semi-autonomous educational trust in Nairobi. King's and University of Nairobi uh, partnered to set up this center because what if we're not at King's anymore? What happens? So that you then have centers of excellence in Africa where people can get these degrees in case there's no Carnegie Corporation of New York, in, in case there's no DFID, in case there's no Sigrid Drowsing Trust. That was 10 years later. Helena, I need to tell them what happened to the fellows after 10 years. And I want to thank you because I can't really uh, express the kinds of impact that have come as a result of this. Future leaders who will transform the continent. We wanted to build a community of leaders who would generate the knowledge for peace and security in Africa. It's a project of a generation. I can't tell you, but I think they can tell you themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you.